All right, guys, y'all got me working hard for y'all today. So I want to cover with y'all the concept, the difference between a good king and priest and the wicked concept of the world's king and priest. Now, I've said this a million times, and I just like it because it's my two favorite examples. In 325 AD, Constantine, was the, who was the king of Rome, called together the Nicene Council, and that's when they put their public, the king put his stamp on religious decrees. Now, I've said that a million times because it's so important. So 325 AD, and then again in 1611 when King James put his royal stamp on religious decrees. And I've shown y'all that through um, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament with Kittle. He was Gerard Kittle wrote that book. It's a phenomenal piece of work. And so then there's the good concept of king of priests, which kings and priests, which we find in First Peter chapter two and Revelation chapter one and Revelation chapter five. It both speaks of these kings and priests. So right here we're going to kind of track through the Bible, and I'm going to give y'all some examples of how we find these different things. And so what it has to do with is man's hierarchy versus God's hierarchy. So right here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, and in verse 22, it says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So that's how Satan tempted man. So when you have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, translating that into simple terms, it would mean you can do anything you want. And also, you can be your own source of wisdom. Men will look to you for your your very genius opinions. They want to hear your genius opinions, right? So, it goes on to say in verse 22, And Yahweh God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever." Okay, so in Psalm chapter 82, verses 6 through 7, it says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So we, we know that man is capable of his own opinions. I mean, look at the science community nowadays that's completely rejected God. And it, it, this has been around ever since the garden where man said, I can have my own opinions. I can be my own source of wisdom. I don't need God. So <clears throat> in John chapter 10, verses 34 to 38, it says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. And the scripture says, we've been made sons of God, and a son is the one who receives the inheritance of the Father. So he goes on to say, if I said, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. If I'm not doing the works of a Christian, don't believe me, right? And it says that it's the Father who worketh in you both the will and to do his good pleasure. So God works through us, and Isaiah said that as well. But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. And in the heart of Jesus, which is what John 14-17 through 17 has been called, he explains, he's going to come to us, he's going to work through us. He's not going to leave us comfortless, but him and his Father are going to come and work in us. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a kingly priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see that there is an evil concept of kings and priests, and they create these man-made decrees and opinions and put their staple on it, because they get the secular government's approval on these decrees, as in 325 A.D. and in 1611. So they go to man's wisdom. They look to man for his wisdom. They look and are partial towards man. They have partiality. They want these, the flattery of being able to say, look at me, I'm a genius. You can come to me for 
all of the answers. And God says, no, that is wrong. <laughs> and we can kind of see both of those ideas working here. But we look to God. If the word of God has come to us, then we are gods. But God means a pluralis magistatus, which means a an actual... It's not us, it's God working through us. And the word of God, when it comes to us, it says that we are the sons of God. And he says, he calleth them gods unto whom the word of God came. We're not saying that we are Yahweh, but we're saying that Yahweh works through us. So again, in John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am divine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. We look to him, not to man. Mark 10, 42 through 45, it says, But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so, it, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, that word exercise lordship and exercise authority has the exact same meaning as it does in as the words in Genesis chapter 6. Let me go there for you. I actually took a picture of it. It says, And it began to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah's, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And that's the, what happened is the people who believed the truth began to intermix with the lie. And he always said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. And this is the tyrants. This is the same thing Jesus is speaking of in Matt and Mark chapter 10 there. Giants in the earth in those days, these fallers, the ones who exercise authority, and also after that when the sons of God came in into the daughters of men. So it's saying during the same time, and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And these men of old, the men of renown, are like these men like Billy Graham, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, um, Chuck Missler, all these different guys who have this civil and secular religion combined with God's word. So you can, you can satisfy both people. And these, there are tyrants in the earth these days all around us, in our families, our friends, in the government, in the churches, in the businesses, they all have tyrants. But the true ecclesia doesn't because they're not going to do that because they belong to God. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now these men of renown are like Korah, Cain, Balaam. They... We see that in Genesis 11. It says, they said, let us make us a name. And renown means of name. And again, Korah says they were famous men among the congregation. Men of renown are men of name. So we see that with Korah, Cain, and Balaam, which are big time types of evil men. So while this is on my mind, I wanted to actually, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop these when I'm done with them. So I remember which ones I've already gone over. So we've gone over that. Let me see. One moment. All right, so we've gone over that one already. And one moment, please. I'm going to go ahead and drop this out here. Let me make sure it's the right one. Yes, because we've already gone over this one and blue letter Bible there. So, okay, <clears throat> we're going to look at, so these men of renown, here's what Clement had to say. He said, and this is in Philip Schaeff's book, so for example, in the well-known passage of Clement, as if one should be changed from the man to the beast after the, ma the manner of one charmed by Circe, 
so a man ceases to be God's and to continue faithful to the Lord when he sets himself up against the ecclesia tradition and flies off to positions of human caprice. And caprice means to fluctuate, be whimsy, fickle. So um, there, it's talking about looking for positions of hierarchy. So again here, in Philip Schaeff, it says, Nor can we suppose that those fathers ever thought of a, of a blind and slavish subjection of private judgment to ecclesiastical authority and to, be, and to the decision of the bishops of the apostolic mother churches. The same Irenaeus, Irenaeus frankly opposed the Roman bishop vicar. So it was never set up that all of these different groups were to answer to one local government, which is what it became in the Roman Catholic tradition. The Roman Catholics took over, and that was the Roman government. And so the Roman government seized control of the actual early ecclesia. And they kind of relinquished it too. So this had a huge impact on me right here, this particular this particular reference book. It's this complete biblical library. And this is the commentary out of it over Mark 10, verses 42 through 45. So it says, let me make that bigger. Jesus called the group together and without embarrassing them with a review of what had just gone on, pointed out that neither selfish ambition nor bitter jealousy had any place in the family of God. Beginning his teaching on a level which they understood, he pointed out that the kind of preeminence for which they were looking was the kind which could be found among the nations of the world, the Gentile nations, as we're going to see. The phrase accounted to rule may be understood as either those who think themselves to be rulers or perhaps better, those who are the so-called rulers, those who are reputed to be rulers. There may be some irony in how Jesus expresses it, meaning those who are supposed to be rulers but really don't act like proper rulers. Actually, they simply exploit rather than lead properly the people for their own advantage. Exercise lordship and exercise authority, both compound verbs, meaning lord down upon, as I've shown in Genesis 6 there, that word giants has this meaning. Tyrants and have authority down upon, respectively, emphasize the arbitrary rule and tyranny of world rulers. So much earthly type rule is only maintained by force and coercion, and this is not the way the family of God will behave, right? So, <laughs> okay, so he says, not the way of the family of God. The disciples were unwittingly imitating the type of Gentile rule which they as Jews had come to despise. And we're going to see that in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and in 1 Samuel chapter 12. And that's exactly what Jesus is speaking to is the Gentiles, the heathen rulers. And that's what the Jews asked for there in Samuel. So right here it says, the maxim Jesus had given in 935 of Mark under different circumstances is now given in a more expanded form, but marks how differently Christ views greatness. Among you refers to the new kingdom society. The kingdom brotherhood relationship had already begun, but the disciples by their actions had shown they had not yet grasped the meaning of this new family relationship. Jesus did not condemn the desire for greatness. Rather, he taught that the way to greatness is not through lording it over others. It consists in self-giving and humble service Greatness can only be secured through true, humble ministry. There is an interesting contrast in the parallelism of verses 43 and 44. In verse 43, the contrast is between being great and being a minister. And in verse 44, it is between being first or chiefest and being a slave. A minister is a servant and attendant. A slave is a bond slave. There you go. Nothing like we see happening today. This verse is parallel to the preceding one, but it advances and intensifies the thought. The one who desires to be first, chief, preeminent of the great, in verse 43, must be servant, literally slave of all. As first is more eminent than great, so servant is a lower position than minister. Further, he must be servant or slave of all. The greater one wishes to become 
in the kingdom, the greater the self-serving. The greater one wishes to become in the kingdom, the greater the self-giving. Yeah, sorry. So the greater one wishes to become in the kingdom, the greater the self-giving. So you have to become greater at self-giving. Jesus did not exclude himself from this great principle. The messianic kingdom gave himself to the messianic king gave himself the ministry, the zenith of which was his self-sacrifice on the cross. Though he humbly received the service of others, Mark 15, verse 41, his purpose in the incarnation was service, Luke 22, verse 27. For this purpose he took the form of a servant, Philippians 2, verse 7. His death was, was the supreme act of humility, service, and self-giving. Ransom is the price paid for the release of a slave, the price by which one is set free. His death was more than that of a martyr. It was vicarious. Jesus died not merely for one benefit. He died in our place. As our substitute, he gave his life to satisfy divine justice so that God could now justly justify those who come to him by faith. Romans 3.26 his one life was given for a multitude. Many should not be understood in the sense of limited atonement. Um, I'm not, I mean, only the believers are the ones who are going to be atoned for, not non-believers. That's their condemnation, is that they do not believe, the scripture says. So, all right, let me drop some of these in the dump folder. Okay, so we've covered these. All right, now I wanted to go ahead and show you something while it was fresh on my mind. And it's about Diotrephes who love to have the preeminence. So Diotrephes, let me see if I can spell it. All right. Back me up, Google. Back me up. Diotrephes love to have the preeminence. I can't sp spell some of those words. So <laughs> there we go. All right, 3 John 1 9. There we go. So we're going to open 3 John 1 9. All right, so it says. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the ecclesia. So Diotrephes loved to have the preeminence, but the scripture says that Christ is preeminent. So let me see. Preeminent. Uh, you can see how many times I've spelt it wrong before too there. So preeminent. There we go. Got it. Sorry about that y'all. So it says in Colossians 1.18 it says, and he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Christ is preeminent, not Diotrephes over there, as we saw, that he loved to have the preeminence there among them, and he received them not. Christ is the preeminent one, and that's the same thing Clement was speaking of a moment ago when it says that as one charmed by Circe, they go flying after positions of human caprice. They want hierarchy. They want to follow man and his religion. In 1 Peter 5.3, he says, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. That's the same word, kata curiao, that's used here in Mark 10, when it says, exercise lordship, kata curiao, and exercise authority here is kata exousia, and we're going to look at those. All right, let me get back to the main page here. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and open this right here to give you a little backdrop. This is Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And right here he's explaining. In three verses very close to one another, 
Ecclesia is used of a gathering of the people. That is a secular assembly. Here, ecclesia is a secular term in the full sense. If we follow the fundamentally necessary and reasonable principle that the same word should be rendered consistently in the same author, this excludes the use of church. On the other hand, it also excludes the English congregation and even the German Gemite is normally used ecclesiastically unless there is some such preceding adjective as political. Here we go. This leaves us with very little option but the simple rendering assembly, assembly or gathering. On this basis, we can then differentiate between secular and ecclesiastical assemblies even though we use the same term. There you go. Ecclesia means assembly or gathering. That's simple. And Jesus said, where two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And we're going to look at that. But right here in a footnote, this is an important footnote here in the Kittle. It says, this does not mean that we should banish the word church and congregation from our vocabulary. I disagree. Apart from the impossibility of such an undertaking, there would be no sense in forfeiting the wealth of meaning proper to these terms. What is needed is that we should grasp the precise significance of the word ecclesia, since at this point linguistic sobriety, yes, we need linguistic sobriety, will help us to the true meaning and bearing from the standpoint of biblical theology. Yes, we do need to clarify what the ecclesia is because it is not the same thing as what the world calls church. All right, let's take a little bit more of a look at that in the book, Pagan Christianity, question mark, Pagan Christianity by, by George Barna and Frank Viola. Okay, so right here it says, you cannot go to something that you are. Like when they say, let's go to church. Well, you already are the church. And Jesus said, we're two or three gather in my name. As Kittle there said, gathering or assembly should be what the translation of ecclesia is. So let me show you that real fast. Here in Matthew 18, verse 20, I believe it is. He says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And then again in Hebrews 10, 25, a gathering or an assembling, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, that verse is speaking to the exact same thing that Matthew 18, 20 is. When we're speaking of Christ together, Christ is in the midst of us. That's what the Ecclesia is. Okay, right here in pagan Christianity, because <laughs> it's got a question mark, you know, it says, you can't, cannot go to something that you are. Throughout the New Testament, Ecclesia always refers to an assembly of people, not to a place. Ecclesia, in every one of its 114 appearances in the New Testament, refers to an assembly of people. The English word church is derived from the Greek word kuriakon, which I don't agree with that because Circe, which is the one who causes them to drink for, from their cup, is exactly what Revelation speaks of. So the woman who causes them to drink from their cup is this Kirky, which is Circe, and I've done a lot of work on that. And a lot of people don't believe it comes from Kuriakon, which means belonging to the Lord. And Tom, it took on the meaning of God's house and referred to a building. In the McClintock and Strong's, if you look at the entry of church, it explains that it actually was borrowed from pagan missionaries. Church. And that's what they called their circles, their prayer circles, Circe, circle, uh, church, all come from the same place. A circuit. <laughs> all right, so let me see. Okay, right here it says, Strikingly, nowhere in the New Testament do we find the terms church, ecclesia, temple, or house of God used to refer to a building. To the ears of a first century Christian, Calling an ecclesia church a building would have been like calling your wife a condominium or your mother a skyscraper. <laughs> so let's see. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop these into my, my dump folder over there so I can remember which ones I've gone over and which ones I haven't. 
All right, so again here in Philip Shea, he explains in one place, let me see, Peter also warns against hierarchical ambition in prophetic anticipation of the abuse of his name and his primacy among the apostles. And what that's in reference to is this verse right here. When he warns them in 1 Peter 5.3, Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. That's why he's warning them. He knows that they're going to try to do that with his name. And he doesn't believe that. Okay. So let's look at this book right here by Robert Baker. Where he says, the functioning New Testament church showed no signs of developing into an ecclesiastical hierarchy or spiritual despotism, tyranny. It was a local autonomous body with two officers and two ordinances. The two officers were pastors, sometimes called bishop, presbyter, or elder, minister, or shepherd, and deacon. These leaders usually worked with their hands for their material needs. There was no artificial distinction between clergy and laity. Amen. Where in the world did that come from? It's a corruption. The pastors had no more authority in offering salvation through Christ than did any other member of their body. Their distinguishing marks were the gifts of leadership given them through the Spirit and their willingness to be used of God. In view of the latter pretensions of the Roman pastor or bishop, it should be mentioned that each church was completely independent of external control. There you go. No external control. Like... All of these buildings have consensuses and concessions and synods and these boards and groups and guilds and colleges that they all answer to, which is completely wicked. The modern day churches do. There is no indication anywhere in the literature of this period that the Apostle Peter ever served as pastor in Rome, nor for that matter is there any basis for believing that the church at Rome was founded by any apostle. Doubtless it was organized by men converted at Pentecost. Here's another corruption I've shared. The two ordinances were baptism and the Lord's Supper. And he's talking about the sacraments that everyone believes in, eating crackers and grape juice and being dunked in water, which is not what baptism is, and that's not what communion is. These were simply symbolic mem memorials. Salvation or spiritual gifts did not come through either one. Amen. The transference of spiritual regeneration and spiritual merit to these ordinances is a development that comes through later corruptions. Amen. Worship was simple, consisting of the singing of hymns, praying, reading of scriptures, and exhortations. Bingo. Okay. So let me make sure we covered what everything there. Okay, yes. So I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop these. We've covered those. Let me see. Okay. <clears throat> so right here, we, we covered how they exercise authority. Now this is, again, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament by Kittle. And he explains that... This word means not the misuse of power, but it's possession and exercise. So not to have it at all. <laughs> it is not found elsewhere in secular Greek, nor... Okay, so that's what this reminds us of the scripture, because this word means not the misuse of power, but it's possession and the exercise. So using power on each other. In the New Testament, it occurs only at Matthew 10, 42. Here, its primary sense is that they exercise power over them. There is no earthly government without the use of force. But if the reference is, is not merely to the authorities, it is likely that the word implies the tendency towards compulsion or oppression, which is imminent in all earthly power, and not merely in, in political. The word also seems to be used in this sense in Acts. Um, that reference there. So right here, it explains again, this is the other word. The one before is exercise authority. This one right here is exercise lordship. And this is the one used in Mark 10 and in 1 Peter chapter 5 there. So he says, Latter the force of the 
preposition was completely lost and in the 6th century AD it came to mean to have title to something. In the Septuagint it is almost always used of the rule of an alien that is of man over the earth. Genesis 1.28 are over animals of sin over man of foreign conquest and domination of God only at Jeremiah 3.14 so in the Septuagint. So it occurs in the New Testament of, I, I wrote right here, sense of entitlement. That's what people feel, is that they have a sense of an entitlement, right? It occurs in the New Testament at Mark 10, verse 42. And, okay, so, here, the kata, which is used twice in the parallelism, is not without significance. And the word means the exercise of dominion against someone, that is, to one's own advantage. Another instance is Acts 19.16 where it occurs with reference to the man possessed of an unclean spirit. Similarly, the force of the kata may still be seen in 1 Peter 5.2. That is, the elders, each over his portion, are not to exercise their power for themselves and therewith against those entrusted to them. And as we'll see in A.T. Robertson, he says it is completely backwards of how we see it. So this is the same passage as in Mark 10, but this one here is in Matthew 20, starting in verse 26. A.T. Robertson explained, and whoever wishes to become great, Jesus does not condemn the desire to become great. It is a laudable ambition. There are great ones among Christians as among pagans, but they do not lord it over one another. Cata curiosin, a Septuagint word, and very expressive, or play the tyrant, as we showed in Genesis 6, where they translated it giant. It means a tyrant or bully. And bull is, tyrant is from Taurus, which means bull, as in Tyrannosaurus Rex, it means tyrant lizard king. And that's where we get our word bully. A bull, right? <laughs> Another suggestive word. Your servant. This word may come from dia in konos, dust, to raise a dust by one's hurry, and so to minister. It is a general word for servant and is used in a variety of ways, including the technical sense of our word deacon in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. More frequently, it was applied in the New Testament church to ministers of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 3.5. The way to be first, protos, says Jesus is to be servant, doulos, this reversed popular opinion then as now. So then and now, this is not the way people see it. They do not want to serve. They do not want to slay. And that word protos is the same word that's in the word preeminence that's used for Jesus. He is protos. He is the first. He's in charge. Not like these men who desire to be high priest or chief priest or have the uppermost rooms at feasts and the, the uppermost rooms in synagogues, and that's related to that word proto, and sometimes they use the word RK, which means first or chief, as in hierarchy, monarchy, oligarchy. Okay, so let's close that. We've looked at, let me make sure we looked at both of them. Yes. All right, so I'll go ahead and drag and drop these. All right. So let's look at these historical corruptions as I've I've shared with y'all. Let me see. All right, so there were three historical periods when a bevy of changes were made in common Christian practices, and we're in Viola again. Viola, Frank Viola, and George Barna's book *Pagan Christianity* with a question mark there. So. There were three historical periods when the bevy of changes were made in common Christian practices. The era, of, the era of Constantine, the decades surrounding the Protestant Reformation, and the revivalist period of the 18th and 19th centuries. But as you are about to find out, those changes were the result of passionate, though often ill-informed, followers of Christ. The believers during those periods simply went along for the ride, which resulted in new perspectives and practices that churches have held on to for many years. So many years, in fact, that you probably think of those routines as biblical in origin. So I completely would scratch that because Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. 
the Protestant Reformation is not true Christianity. They were trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church, and the frontier revivalism is just another form of Protestantism. So it says right here, and I'm, that's, I want to show you how appalling this is. So we are also encouraged to read our Bibles, but we are conditioned to read the Bible with the lens handed to us by Christian tradition to which we belong. We are taught to obey our denomination, our movement, and never to challenge what it teaches. Now listen to what they say here. At this moment, all the rebellious hearts are applauding and are plotting to wield the, par the above paragraphs to wreak havoc in their churches. If that is you, dear rebellious heart, you have missed our point by a considerable distance. We do not Stand with you. Our advice, either leave your church quietly, refusing to cause division, or be at peace with it. There is a vast gulf between rebellion and taking a stand for what is true. So, the fact is, the Bible teaches us to rebuke, and the, the Bible teaches us to admonish. The Bible teaches us to reprove. And it also tells us that Jesus came to Jesus said, I came to cause division. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And I'm going to divide families. I'm going to divide Friends, I'm going to divide these different institutions here. So they are certainly, I'm um, always ashamed that these guys don't rebuke anybody. The only thing people rebuke people for today is when you rebuke. <laughs> That's the only time someone uses rebuke is when they see someone rebuking. All right, so I, it looks like I'm running out of time here, but I wanted to share some more verses with y'all about God being king. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. Yahweh shall rule over you. And then again in 1 Samuel 2.29, a man of God is rebuking Eli, and it says, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, honoring your own family instead of God, or someone at a church, or someone at a business instead of God, or at a school, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. So they were. he was honoring his sons. He should have went in there and ran them out of the temple for the things they were doing. Eli should have. So again in 1 Samuel 8, verses 5 and 7, And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And that word in the original Hebrew actually means the Gentiles, because they saw this king Nekosh we're about to read about in 1 Samuel 12. They wanted a king like that. And Yahweh said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them or be the king. And that word should have been Gentiles, and that connects it to Mark 10, to 1 Peter 5, about these people who exercise authority and exercise lordship. They want men to exercise lordship, not God. So in 1 Samuel 12, verse 12 and verse 17, it says, And when ye saw that Nahash, and this is the exact same title as Satan in Genesis chapter 3, serpent, the word serpent is Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon came against you. You said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us. When Yahweh, your God, was your king, is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto Yahweh, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of Yahweh in asking you a king. God is your king. What do you want a man king for? That's the same thing that happened in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 6, it began to happen again after the flood in Genesis 11. That's what's happening in Mark chapter 10, and that's what they do today. They put man on a pedestal. And they run back and tell these men they see kings as kings instead of studying to show themselves approved unto God, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, I believe. It says, Ecclesiastes 10, 20, Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. So they'll run back and tell the people that ruled them. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God, keep His commandments. Isaiah 29, 13. Wherefore Yahweh said, 
For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. By what men teach, not what God teaches. Oh, sorry. Whoa, whoa. All right. So, Jeremiah 10, verse 7 says, Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? God. <laughs> king. God is the king. For to thee doth it appertain for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. And then in Hosea 13, 9 through 11, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? And thy judges, as whom thou said, give me a king and princes, referring back up here to Samuel when they first asked for a king, and in Gideon when they asked Gideon to become king, here in Judges chapter 8 verses 22 through 23. So here in Hosea 13, 9 through 11, that's what he's saying. And he says, And thy judges of whom thou saidst, Give me a king and princes. I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. So God gives kings and takes them away at will. He is a king. Malachi 1, 6, A son on earth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And I, if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith Yahweh of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And he said, Wherein have we despised thy name? So they despise him. They despise God. They want to teach their own doctrines. They want to be the high preeminent ones like Diotrephes. Malachi 2 verses 11 through 12. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of Yahweh, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Genesis chapter 6 again there. The sons of God marrying the daughters of men is a type of intermingling truth with a lie, mixing in all this paganism and the will of the year with the Bible and just making it uh, do anything you want. It's kind of celebration. So Yahweh will cut off the man who doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto Yahweh of hosts. So the master and the scholar, like these men, like R.C. Sproul, or um, R.C. Sproul, Chuck Swindoll, Chuck Smith, um, John MacArthur, I'm not sure if I said him, like even Chuck Missler, all of these different guys combine in the paganism as they want, as they see fit. God says, I will cut off the master and the scholar who does that. So I wanted to share with you a verse, let not the wise man in Jeremiah. So thus saith the Yahweh, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glorieth in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the, Lord, the Yahweh which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith Yahweh. All right, so let's get back to what I've shown for you there is that God is king and never man. Let me see. All right, so right here. And they don't like to be questioned. Socrates in 470 to 399 BC is considered by some historians to be the father of philosophy, born and raised in Athens. His custom was to go about the town relentlessly raising questions and analyzing the popular views of his day. Socrates believed that truth is found by dialoguing extensively about an issue and relentlessly questioning it. This method is known as dialectic or the Socratic method. He thought freely on matters that his fellow Athenians felt were closed, closed for discussion. Socrates' habit of pelting people with searching questions and roping them into critical dialogues about their accepted customs eventually got him killed. His incessant questioning of tightly held traditions provoked the leaders of Athens to charge him with corrupting the youth. As a result, they put Socrates to death. A clear message was sent to his fellow Athenians, all who ask the established customs, all who question the established customs 
will meet the same fate. Socrates was not the only provocateur to reap severe reprisal for his nonconformity. Isaiah was sawn in half, according to tradition, of course. They're not sure if that's who was sawn in half. John the Baptist was beheaded, and Jesus was crucified, not to mention the thousands of Christians who have been tortured and martyred through the centuries by the institutional church because they dared to challenge its teachings. As Christians, we are taught by our leaders to believe certain. Okay, so that's all I wanted to share there. Let me see. I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop those into here since I've read it. All right. So now I'm going to share with you from the Hastings, um, the Dictionary of the Bible by James Hastings. He says, Let me see. The difference of name between elders and bishops may point to some difference of origin or duties, but in the New Testament and in Clement of Rome, the term often appears equivalent. <clears throat> Thus, the elders of Ephesus are reminded in Acts 20:28 20, that they are bishops. In the pastoral epistles, Timothy appoints bishops and deacons, Titus elders and deacons. Through Timothy, also 1 Timothy 5. 17 has elders under him. The qualifications of the elder, as described to Titus, are practically those of the bishop as given to Timothy. And it is added in Titus 1 7 that the elders must be such because the bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless, etc., which is decisive that the bishop's office was at least as wide as the elders. And moreover, in both cases, the duties implied are ministerial, not governmental. Not governmental. If the elder's duty is to rule in 1 Timothy 5.17, he does it subject to Timothy, much as a modern elder rules subject to his bishop. Twice over, St. Paul gives something like a list of the chief persons of the church. In 1 Corinthians 12.28, he counts up first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, then healers, helpers, administrators, speakers in various kinds of tongues, it will be noticed that all the work words after the first two plainly described functions, not offices. Functions, not offices. Offices, as I've shown in my analysis of the King James Bible, is a corruption. It's not even there. They put that there. A few years later, he, or the author of Ephesians in 4.11, tells us how the ascended Lord gave his gifts to the church, that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, diaconia, kania, they are all of them deacons, whatever more they may be. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop these. Um, did I drag and... Oh, let me close that. So, all right. Now we're going to go through here. Even Adam Nicholson in God's Secretaries knows this. He says... It is in part a question of scale and of perspective from the point of view of the English establishment, the events in the small agricultural communities around Scrooby and Gainsborough on the borders of Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire were no more than minor irritations at the outer edge of their concerns. And this is during the time of the King James translation. There was a tiny cell of radical thinking here. With strong Cambridge connections, a stream of fire-breathing preachers coming north from the university city wedded to all those extreme Puritan beliefs which the broadly tolerant English church and state felt unable to accommodate. The separatist model was the ancient church of Antioch, in which there had been neither bishop nor clergy of any kind, and which was ruled by the Spirit, amen, manifesting itself through the congregation, amen. It was the congregation that appointed and ordained its own pastors, teachers, lay elders, and deacons. And you get into a questioning there, because God ordains who believes and who doesn't. And these gatherings, often in stables and outhouses, away from the sight of the church authorities, the priesthood of all believers was a living reality. One moment. Let me find my place again. Was a living reality. Sorry. Was a living reality. I'm not sure if I took a... Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. I accidentally put them in the wrong order. Their services might last four hours, much of which was spent in prayer, often extempore with 
no help from any prayer book, an unregulated private spirit guiding the prophecies of the faithful. Anyone, whether artisan or peasant, could expound the meaning of the scriptures. They held as their guiding sign the word of St. Peter to all members of the church. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness to do his marvelous light. The accompanying note in the Geneva Bible with the Scrooby Separatists would have read, make it quite clear, makes it quite clear. All right, now i got to go backwards, actually. Let me find my place again. People like them, it reassured them, were God's elect. They were the true believers, and the rest of the world who clearly did not attend as closely as they did to the very word of God would be damned to hell. Amen. you got to believe in God. you got to believe Jesus Christ's words. He said you're con they're condemned because they chose darkness instead of light. Unless any man should doubt whether he is chosen or not, the apostles calls us back to the voice of the gospel sounding both in our ears and minds. Listen to the words of the Bible and you will be saved. Nothing else is necessary. It is that singularity of conviction which drove the Puritan and Pilgrim experience. They left. They left England and came to America. Okay, so I've shown this several times that King James ran, so Reynolds had wanted, when all the code was stripped away, a strict Puritan Bible, not an Episcopal, meaning no bishops, the naked word of God, truly transmitted. And to that request, James had said in effect, no, I will not do that. We're sticking to the Elizabethan bishops Bible. <laughs> yes, I will give you the very opposite of what you ask. A translation that was to be uniform, in other words, with no contentious Geneva style and interpretation set alongside or within the text with the learned authority of Oxford and Cambridge which he could control and he gave a letter and his 15 instructions to the translators to keep the old ecclesiastical terms which is why we have church office of bishop bishop office of deacon um, office instead of function in certain places it's a corruption it's not true some of the times the word office isn't even there office of the priesthood Office of deacon, office of bishop, office of priesthood, they put the word office there. It's not in the original, which at least in the upper echelons were profoundly conservative institutions, both of which had sent to the king long and high-flown refutations of every point in the Puritans' millenary petition to be revised by the bishops, the very influence that Reynolds did not want. Then, given for goodness sake to the privy council, in effect a central censorship committee, with which the government would ensure that its stamp was on the text, not deviationism or subversion allowed. And finally, to James himself, whose hostility to any whiff of radicalism this afternoon had been clear enough. And this fero ferociously Episcopal and monarchical Bible was to be the only translation that could be read in the church, no other. The treasured Geneva Bible would be forced to retreat into the privacy of people's homes and could no longer be used for public preaching. And you better not get caught with one. The Puritans had asked that they wanted to distinguish themselves from the true extremists who took from the New Testament that each congregation should be independent and free of all worldly authority. So even the Puritans were corrupting because we want God as authority, not man, but as faithful servants of Christ and loyal subjects describing themselves as ministers of the gospel. The desire not... A uh, disorderly innovation, nothing was more loathsome to the 17th century mind than the idea of innovation. New was a term of abuse, primitivist, old of the highest praise, but a due and godly reformation they laid on the supplicatory language. So they wanted it right here, neither as factitious men affecting a popular party in the church, no hint of getting rid of the bishops, because they, they did want to get rid of the bishops. They wanted to distinguish themselves from the true extremists, but they knew that you're supposed to not have these forms of government in the church. So, let's see. All right, let me see if I covered all of these real quick. All right, covered that one, 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 covered that one. I accidentally put this in the wrong place. No wonder I couldn't find it. Years, in fact, that you probably think of those routines as biblical in origin. Not surprisingly, having changed the biblical model of the church, we have become adept at building support for our approaches through proof texting, proof testing, Proof texting is the practice of taking disparate, unrelated verses of Scripture, 
often out of context to prove that our position squares with the Bible. As you read this book, you may be stunned to discover how many of our esteemed practices are way off the mark biblically. Okay, so we don't want to be proof texting. We don't want to say we believe the essentials and the fundamentals because that's just double speak and those are up in the air kind of things that require more in-depth research than just saying that you are not against the orthodox, which is what people believe is the right way, but that often just translates to men's opinions are held in place of actual studying and loving God's word. So people will follow men instead of God. So I'm going to go ahead and dump these over there. And um, I appreciate y'all taking the time to watch. And I know we just covered a lot of information, but I feel this will help you explain how we got to such a corrupt place on this planet with following men rather than God. So we have to follow God and never men. And there we track the history of the corruption. So I hope that that helps and give me some feedback. Let me know what you think and um, touch base with me and say, hey, what's up, man? And, you know, we can contact one another because we love God. All right. Y'all take care. Bye.